Again, welcome everyone to the Valence Habitat Map Rollout Webinar. My name is Christina Grasso from the San Francisco Estuary Institute, and we are really excited to announce the WRMP has recently released the Valence Habitat Map 2020. This is a foundational map for the monitoring program since it shows the distribution and the extent of our Valence. And today, my colleague Alex Bro will be providing an overview on the repeatable and standardized mapping methods that were developed to create the map. And then April Robinson will discuss how the information from the map can then be used in analyses. And we'll have plenty of time for questions and comments at the end. But before we get started, we really just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge the vision and support of our EPA colleagues. So the EPA's Water Quality Improvement Fund funded the Balance Habitat Map and the development of the innovative and automated mapping techniques that you'll hear about today. And this map serves as the base map for the WRMP and will be used to detect change in our region's habitats. So these repeatable standardized mapping methods will enable the WRMP to collectively track progress towards the region's restoration goals and assess if the targets that have been set are resulting in on the ground actions. So we're really excited to provide you an overview. And then with that, I think Alex will start. Thank you, Christina. Um, again, my name is Alex Burrow. I'm a GIS specialist environmental scientist at the San Francisco Institute yeah. and I help lead the development Alex, of balance habitat. Your voice is kind of coming in and out. Maybe you want to turn off your video. Sure. Thank you. How, how's it now? Much better. Thank Great. you. <laughs> um, well, thank you. Uh, again, my name is Alex Bro. Uh, I'm a GIS specialist and environmental scientist at the San Francisco Estuary Institute. Uh, and I helped lead the development of the Bayland Habitat Map, and I'm happy to share uh, so a little bit more detail about its development. Uh, and then April is going to share a little bit more about the application. So, so for some background, the Bayland Habitat Map um, is really had some main objectives, and really Excuse for the wetlands region monitoring program. Yes. Okay, I just want to make sure we can see your screen. Perfect. Okay, go ahead. Oh, great. Uh, so again, the main objectives uh, is to really detect landscape change over time. Uh, the previous mapping that we had is uh, from an effort of the, the Bay Area Aquatic Resources Inventory in the modern baylands that were developed in 2009. So really, it was time uh, for an update to this habitat mapping, uh, but also a, a manner to sort of create a data set and a method that we were able to sort of repeat uh, over time uh, with able to do change detection in a much more efficient manner. So again, the goal is to be consistent and repeatable. The past habitat mapping used uh, what was called heads up digitizing. So literally staff uh, zooming around the bay in a GIS and digitizing points and polygons around the bay uh, to sort of classify the habitats. And really there's a lot of interpretation error that comes from that type of uh, mapping. And it's a lot of manual labor. And so really, with the advancements in technology uh, today, we're really trying to uh, leverage these opportunities to create an algorithm that was um, repeatable. And again, the main goal is to be able to attract and assess uh, our restoration goals, as well as um, the impacts of climate change on our tidal marshes. So here's an effort uh, looking at 2009, and you can see the first um, teaser, I guess, of the Valence Habitat map from 2020. Uh, and again, I'm going to describe the details on this habitat mapping uh, and how it's developed. So the habitat map has 18 plus classes. I say plus because there is a few classes that we're still trying to uh, refine. And I'll mention that a little bit in the next slide. Uh, but again, it is a sub meter resolution. So we used aerial imagery that was at 60 centimeter resolution. And that is the resolution of our data sets. Uh, and again, our goal is to aim to remap every three to five years. And to do that, we did build a computer algorithm that enables this uh, to sort of occur and enables, uh, enables us to improve that algorithm over time as well. An important caveat is to make note that the extent, you can see that it has the gray outline there, is really what we find is the possible title influence. So we have Dyke Balins and we have um, intertidal uh, habitats uh, but it, it kind of reaches, we kind of have a, a limit uh, that kind of 
highest astronomical tide. And I'll get into that in the classification. So it is a bit of a question. I've created these sort of uh, categories here. We have our subtitle classes. We have intertidal, full title connection. And then we have also this intertidal limited to no title connection. So that's kind of an important caveat there. There is some classes. You can even see the muted to marsh there on the top right is in that subcategory of limited to no title connection. Uh, and muted is really just sort of describing that the title um, amplitude is dampened. Uh, so therefore, if it has some sort of uh, typically, um, you know, a culvert or something that's restricting the title flow, uh, dictates that muted category. But something to keep in mind in terms of the classification, and it, it matters for the development of our um, we also have a few sub super title classes, including levees and dunes uh, as well. So I'm going to describe a little bit of a few challenges to mapping valence habitat maps, uh, valence habitats, and particularly from a you know manner that we tell a computer to do so. Uh, so to kind of share some of these, you know, there's sort of a you know challenge of where do you find the bay edge? You know, is it you know one place where you have kind of a low marsh, uh, the cord grass, the spartina? Is there sort of a seasonal on that front edge, or is it kind of that more geomorphic edge where we have maybe a, a you know a higher marsh plain elevation? Uh, looking at tidal channels, you know where do we sort of say a tidal channel ends and begins, and then even what's the sort of um, width of a tidal channel? Are we look how do we define where the top of the bank is um, and tell a computer to sort of identify it? Uh, and then the upland thing to sort of define. Uh, uh, so there's a transition area that can be kind of um, a little fuzzy uh, in sort of the transition between sort of internet versus an upland habitat. And then even some places you might have uh, tree cover or shadows, uh, shade, uh, what we're seeing underneath. And then hydrologic connectivity. You know, in some places, as I mentioned, the muted marsh, how do we sort of define or sort of be able to tell um, that sort of distinction between a full tidal connection versus limited tidal connectivity? And so what's the difference between a habitat we're seeing on one side of, say, a, a road or some sort of barrier versus another? Uh, and then I, I guess lastly, the, another main challenge is with aerial imagery. Uh, we use the NAEP, which is the National Agricultural Imagery Program that's flown every two years uh, across the country. Uh, it's a mosaic data set. And so therefore, there's challenges at times whether um, you're seeing water in some places. So is uh, taking a mid-tide or a low tide and sort of show whether you know, be able to tell if there's a mud flat or not in that uh, location. So describe a little bit about the computer algorithm and what, how we developed this uh, method. Uh, it really goes back to this object-based image analysis, which is shorthand for OBIA. Uh, and really, it's rather than taking a raster, so say a pixel, an image that has all these pixels, and evaluating the classification uh, kind of independently for every pixel, we can sort of develop methods that sort of group pixels together based on similar characteristics. And so that's where the sort of object-based is coming um, forward. And you can see on the right-hand side, we can have, have this delineation of the, the pixels into similar categories. And so it's really an iterative kind of workflow uh, of looking at segmentation of the image, its classification, and then iterating through growing and merging and continuing that process. Um, you know, and I'll just be honest that our, our algorithm is uh, quite extensive uh, regarding the amount of classifications we are doing in the nuance there. Um, but I'm gonna show a little bit of how that kind of workflow happened. This is the software that we used. It's called Trimble eCognition Developer. You can see a little bit there on the right, sort of a, a sneak preview of what that uh, rule set looks like. Uh, you can sort of see here the objects. We can sort of pick out in the segmentation, the tidal channels. We can even see different vegetation in this example of kind of along the tidal creeks um, versus sort of the interior parts of the marsh. And I'm gonna describe a little bit of an example workflow. This isn't what I, performed for this methodology, uh, but it kind of gives you a sense of kind of the, the trickiness that can sort of come through, particularly with using aerial imagery um, explicitly. And so here's an example. This is a classic algorithm that is built into the software called a multi-resolution segmentation. We're taking the red band, the green band, the blue band, and the near infrared, and we're kind of putting it through this algorithm to sort of 
uh, chop up the image into these objects. And so these are some basic parameters. And I'm just going to work through kind of how we could, you know, this is the segmentation process. We can then move forward with the classification. And so say we want to take all those objects that have an average NDWI. And NDWI is normalized difference water index. And we can take the green band and the near infrared and kind of do this ratio here. And you can see this is kind of a, a classic threshold of, say, 0.2 for a water versus not water. And we can see how the mudflat doesn't really get fully captured here. Uh, and then even some parts of the marsh are being shown up as uh, as water. So we could sort of maybe say this is like partially under predicted. So maybe we can lower that threshold. Let's say, hey, let's take objects that are greater than 0.1 in DWI. And here we get the full coverage of those mudflats that are showing sort of that water spectral signal. We are getting a bit of overmapping. You can sort of see that bay edge is you know there on the south that is being classified as water. And so this is something we have to sort of work with to sort of refine. You could arguably come back and say, let's go in the middle. Let's say 0 0.15. But really, there's only so much you can do uh, with the aerial imagery explicitly. And, so, and we really need to do better. And so that's where we really leveraged other data sets. And so one particular data set that we used is what we're calling relative tidal elevation. And this is taking elevation data, digital elevation models, and relating it to the different tidal datums that we have and our knowledge of those. And so you know, we can take the land surface elevation and we can compare it to mean sea level and then we can put it underneath the ratio of mean high water and this mean sea level. So what's the relationship to mean high or high water or mean high water? Or how do we define subtitle? So we can sort of take our mean lower low water kind of extent and say that subtitle is sort of below that threshold. And this really gives us sort of a foundation that we can sort of apply the imagery or apply other data sets or other derivatives to classify uh, our mapping. So this is an example here in that same area. You know, we previously were showing the aerial imagery and sort of the water classification. And here on the right is not even an image uh, from the aerial imagery at all. It's actually just a digital elevation model that has been uh, converted to that relative tidal elevation and classified. Uh, a bit based on the different um, elevation characteristics. And you can see we get such great detail in these tidal channels, kind of that marsh edge there in the front. Uh, and really this gives us a much better foundation to sort of do our habitat mapping. And again, just showing you a bit of, you know, that classification previously using the 0.15 in DWI, you can sort of see the difference there uh, that we were capturing. Uh, and it also really helps with the upland distinction. And so this really gives us kind of confidence of where kind of is our uh, transition zones and where is our upland features, make sure we're not having confusion uh, in that vertical direction. Uh, and I guess also it helps with the hydrologic connectivity. And so you can sort of see that road there. We had that example showing hydro hydrologic connectivity. And we see there's kind of a barrier between these two, um, you know, green um, and beige areas. And we can actually use that in the algorithm. There's so many different characteristics and relationships that we can use with these objects. We can say, hey, are these you know, marsh features that we have classified, are they connected to the subtitle area or to the mudflats, uh, or are they not? And so therefore, that disconnected can actually be used as an attribute that helps us with our classification. And then lastly, just the, the Y relative, uh, it really kind of comes down to the variability in our title datums around the estuary. Uh, and really making it all relative allows us to kind of have one algorithm that we can apply to the entire bay. Uh, so that having a consistency in a data set uh, is really uh, helpful for us uh, building an algorithm to apply to the entire uh, lower estuary. So I'm going to show some examples of the map. I think I'm a little bit behind, so I'm going to try to speed up a little bit. Um, but here's some quick screenshots that we have. This is the kind of island ponds in the South Bay. You can sort of see that distinction there, the sort of the tidal channels that we're seeing in these restored areas, uh, the ones that are kind of developing still uh, there on the right-hand side, still a bit unvegetated. Uh, here's the China Camp and the Muzzy Marsh example uh, in Marin. We can sort of see these mutic categories uh, that we highlighted previously. And really, I, I think I want to point out, um, and we even had a meeting earlier today, some technical advisors talking about channel networks. This is really something we paid attention to, to make sure that our habitat um, map was getting kind of connectivity of these channel networks so that we could sort of develop metrics and typologies uh, that were able to sort of leverage um, this map. And so in other habitat maps, you might see 
they might be able to capture water. In some places of the tidal channel, it might have water kind of standing in one part of the creek and not another. You have this kind of disjointed, disconnected uh, network. And so this is something that we really worked with our algorithm to make sure that we could kind of have this connectivity all the way through from the upper parts of the tidal channel uh, to the bay. And again, our data is available to uh, explore. We are still kind of working on a few classes that we'll release in a separate version, but it is available in its original form, uh, the SFEI data center for download. And it's also available on EcoAtlas. Uh, and so I think that someone can share a link to EcoAtlas that you can uh, feel welcome to share uh, or explore. And then for those interested in more information, we have a habitat key with detailed descriptions, as well as methods documentation uh, that includes an accuracy assessment. Uh, here's some screenshots from Equatlas. It's a little bit different symbology, um, but you can sort of explore here. This is the same uh, area that we shared there in the so South Bay. Uh, and then China Camp, you can sort of see uh, the mapping there. And then one area over in Richmond. And it does include pop-ups, so you can have a pop-up and click uh, to sort of describe um, or learn more information about how um, either the type uh, of that habitat uh, or even more on the source data. Uh, the Habitat Key, is, again, is available. We do have illustrative photos uh, to sort of highlight some of these classifications. Uh, and again, the, the classification system is really critical for change over time. And so we can sort of consistently try to map these habitats. Um, and I think April is going to talk a lot more about change over time um, in the next uh, part of the presentation. Uh, just some examples there. Illustrative photos. Uh, and I guess uh, one of the things we want to mention is change detection. We're already thinking about Baylands Habitat Map 20 uh, is kind of the, the key date that we're aiming for right now. And part of that is really doing a better, uh, getting a better LIDAR data set. And so we're working to sort of, we have funding to collect LIDAR um, in 2025 uh, in the next summer. Um, and really, I, we're, I'm really excited for this data set. Uh, the previous iteration of the Valence Habitat map used a kind of compiled Frankenstein even version of different LIDAR data sets, uh, what we could around the bay. And that was really a challenge. Uh, you know, some places we had LIDAR that was collected even in 2010 or 2013 and made it challenging to sort of, you know, uh, detect some of the actual changes we're seeing on the ground and the imagery and sort of relating those two. And so having one consistent data set that's uh, from a recent time period is really going to enable, you know, even better mapping um, for 2024. And we're also hoping to use additional data products out of the LIDAR. And so LIDAR is able to provide not even just sort of the ground elevation, but you can also understand the vegetation, height, and different characteristics and talk about the intensity. Um, and so I can just show you a little bit. We can see elevation in this example. You can see example, if we have vegetation height, we can see a height range that may be able to tell us different characteristics of those habitats. Uh, and then even intensity. Uh, and this is sort of that la laser pulse and sort of what's the strength of that laser pulse returning uh, to the sensor. Uh, and so part of this, we are hoping to sort of um, seek out a little bit more funding. So if anyone is familiar with um, or has any resources uh, to sort of help collaborate, collaboratively cost share some of this LIDAR, um, please reach out to us. We're in that process right now. Uh, we have enough funding to sort of get a, a collection but there is something, if we can kind of um, get a little bit more funding and cost share, um, there really is an opportunity to give you a higher quality data set that really can, you know, have a higher density of uh, points uh, and maybe even give us some more derivative products that we can use. Um, one area for future improvements, the map isn't perfect. Uh, and so we are working in future iterations to kind of refine our algorithm, particularly in restored areas. We're hoping the new LIDAR can really help with that because that was really a limitation is these are actively changing places and we had outdated LIDAR and really would made it a struggle and really also be able to tell so that will improve the elevation data and also maybe um, cause less confusion in some places with biofilm. And then the variability in tidal ponds and pans uh, was kind of a challenge. We really want to be able to track those uh, rates of change over time. And so future improvements will kind of work to enhance that part of the data set as well. Uh, and then, you know, just lastly, I just want to highlight the relationship to the Wetlands Regional Monitoring Program. You know, we really got a lot of feedback and input from our uh, Technical Advisory Committee and our Geospatial Workgroup 
So it was really a, a great collaborative effort in development of this product. And really see this data set as a foundational data set for the wetland stream drill monitoring program for various indicators and other metrics. And April will describe that uh, a good bit. Now, I lastly kind of want to point out that this is kind of an ongoing iterative process. We see this as two-way data exchange. We really see the Wetlands Regional Monitoring Program doing kind of more site-specific monitoring that we can then inform the regional level um, habitat map and other data sets that kind of go in to inform the habitat map. So thinking about, you know, added tight gauges and understanding uh, those relationships to our habitats and then even the vegetation surveys that are planned, you know, be able to use that as ground truthing for future iterations of the habitat map is really critical. Uh, so what does this mean for the region? This is where I'm going to end and I'm going to hand it off to April. But really, a lot of these areas with talking about metrics and indicators and restoration uh, is really just the tip of the iceberg. And so, April, I'd like you to take it away. Thanks so much, Alex. And if you want to go to the next slide. Uh, so Alex has told us about all the thought and effort that's gone into creating this map and just what a great map it is. And I want to talk about some of the ways that the map can be used and give some examples of how the map is already being used. Uh, so just to start real high level before I jump into some examples, one of the things that's really useful about this map is the way it can help us understand how our tidal marshes in the region are doing. We can help track our progress towards restoration goals, understand how marshes are doing with regard to specific aspects, like how well are they supporting wildlife or helping with flood attenuation. And this can be really helpful for tracking change over time as well. Um, as Alex said, the fact that we are developing this as something that's going to be more easily repeatable is going to be so important for that tracking change over time piece of this, which is important both for understanding what's happening with all the restoration we're doing in the area and understanding what's happening with sea level rise as the impacts become more severe. This is also helpful for helping us identify where certain actions can have the most impact, so helpful as a planning tool, and can help with other efforts as well, like supporting field-based monitoring and research. Uh, next slide. So in thinking about how we can assess how our marshes are doing, it's an example of kind of a basic question that we can answer of how much tidal marsh is there in the bay. We can use this map along with other data sets to help track that. This is some preliminary data that we're drawing on both the new Baylands habitat map and some of our project tracker data to, to be able to look at that. And um, I'm not gonna go into all the, the details of the complications of tracking these numbers, but just to say, because because restoration is a complicated piece of this, it's really helpful to be able to bring together this new data set with other existing data sets. Uh, next slide. So just a quick kind of conceptual figure of how we're doing that. We're taking the Valence Habitat map, which is symbolized there as the, the top rectangle on, uh, um, on the right. And we're bringing that together with our project tracker data, which is telling us where we have restoration projects. And we're using that to come up with these different categories that we can track. How much tile marsh do we have? How much of that is it within restoration project areas? How much area do we have that is on its way to becoming marsh, even if it's not marsh right now? So the Valence Habitat Habitat map is incredibly useful and made more useful by the other data sets that we can leverage. Uh, next slide. But zooming in from that whole bay scale to looking at more of a site scale and thinking about how this can be used, we can track pro progress within specific sites, something that can be useful for project managers and regulatory agencies to understand what's happening to a project post-restoration and as, as the site evolves. So this is just an example here comparing our new Valence Habitat map on the right with old Bari data on the left for Pond 6A. So comparing when it was a managed pond to now how it's evolving as of 2020, where we can see the channel formation and bits of vegetation that are starting to form. And as we have more data sets over more time periods, um, we'll be able to see that, that change continue. Uh, next slide. So we can look beyond just how much uh, tidal marsh we have to more of the specific functions by, by looking at some additional more complex metrics and analyses. Uh, so for example, if we want to know more about how sea level rise might be impacting marshes, we can look at things like the elevation of different marshes or how much vegetation we have in marshes and if we're starting to see more open water areas as sea level rise increases. We want to know how much support we have for wildlife, we can look at things like patch size and patch shape and patch connectivity, 
It's just kind of a schematic example there on the right of understanding connectivity of marsh patches to help support species like salt marsh harvest mice. But there's a number of different metrics that have been developed um, through efforts like the Balin's Resilience Framework and through the WRMP that we want to start tracking over time to give us a better sense of how our marshes are doing. Uh, next slide. And this, these are the kind. These are metrics that we can really look at at multiple scales, like multiple metrics at multiple different scales. This is an example of the way the WRMP is planning to look at some of these metrics to be able to scale them in its nested hierarchy, all the way from looking at the whole bay through sub embayments, all the way down to this analysis unit sort of project site level. Uh, next slide. So just showing a quick example of what that might look like. This is showing some data just about different marsh types and marsh features at that sub embayment level all the way down to that analysis unit site level. Uh, next slide. And in addition to tracking over these different spatial scales, we can also use the mapping to track change over time because we plan to repeat this mapping every few years. So we can start to see things like, are our restoration projects developing the way we expect them to? Are the sites vegetating? Are we seeing the types of channel networks that we expect with sea level rise? Are we starting to see erosion on the edges of our marshes? What kinds of changes are we experiencing? And what does this lead us to in terms of the types of actions that we might wanna take or the lessons that we can learn? Next slide. Just one specific example of the way that we can use the maps to track progress. So the Restoration Authority is using the map to analyze some of their performance metrics to look at how the sites that they are funding contribute to the overall marsh patches to make them larger, more connected, and more able to support marsh wildlife. Uh, next slide. So one specific example I wanted to talk about was the Balin's Resilience Framework one of the early applications of the 2020 Balance Habitat Map. Uh, it was designed to measure resilience of Balance systems to sea level rise. And they developed a number of different metrics to look at wildlife support, flood, flood risk, uh, sediment placement, a, a bunch of, of potential actions um, with the idea that these metrics would inform adaptation and restoration. And one specific example is wanting to think about beneficial use of dredge sediment uh, by the Army Corps. Uh, so to do that, some of the specific, I wanna show you some of the specific metrics that they developed that can help understand where the opportunities are. Next slide. So this is the Balin's Resilience Framework um, map. And there, um, this is showing an example of marsh elevation at different marsh locations. So you can think about how you might want to consider when you're doing sediment placement, where are the marshes that are, are relatively low in elevation that might really benefit from having those sediment inputs. Next slide. And this is a different metric that's looking at the distance to shallow water placement. So you can think about where the shallow water placement opportunities are and how far that is from the marshes that might benefit. Uh, next slide. And just to say, there are, like I said, a number of other metrics that the BRF or the Balin's Resilience Framework has developed. So really worth taking a look if you're, you're interested in that. Another example of how this mapping can be used uh, in planning is BCDC's Regional Shoreline Adaptation Plan, the RSAP mapping platform, which is in development right now and which is going to incorporate the Balin's Habitat map. And that's a tool that's meant to be used for coordinated regional adaptation planning. Uh, next slide. Uh, and then just an example of how this, this mapping can be used to support field monitoring and research. Of course, we've shown there's a lot of ways that this mapping can be useful directly for map-based monitoring, uh, but it can also be helpful for work out in the field. And I'm gonna show an example from CRAM, the California Rapid Assessment Method for Monitoring Wetlands. Uh, but there's a number of uh, other examples of the ways that this can support field work, both in the planning and the implementation and the interpretation stages. So for CRAM, these are um, rapid field-based assessments to try to get at the overall condition of a wetland. Before going out to do the assessment, there's a planning stage of wanting to know where you should do your assessments. Uh, so looking at the overall area that you might sample and then doing a sample draw to identify those locations, that's a place where the mapping can be really helpful for understanding that universe of places we could draw points on. The mapping is also useful in the field for orienting and navigating. 
And then specifically for doing the analysis, it's helpful to have the, that mapping out in the field to assess particular metrics of wetland condition, like trying to understand the landscape context or understand how the wetland you're surveying connects to other wetlands within the landscape. Uh, next slide. Okay, so in summary, this is this is a really exciting map because of the new tool, the new approaches that have been used, the automated nature of it, which makes it more easily repeatable. It's exciting because it's been a while since we had an updated map. So there's really a lot of opportunities here for, for this to be a valuable resource for the community for restoration planning, management, and monitoring. We are excited to hear about ways that you all might be able to use this mapping. Uh, in order to access it, you can either go to the project page where you can download it and find out more about the project. Um, I believe there's an um, ArcGIS web viewer on the project page as well. And then the data is also in EcoAtlas, so you can play around and look at the data there as well. Um, next slide. So with that, I just wanted to acknowledge and appreciate all the hard work that's been done by Alex and the larger mapping team uh, to thank the uh, WRMP TAC and Geospatial Workgroup that has overseen and provided guidance on the development of this map. And again, to thank our, our funders, the EPA and Restoration Authority for making this work possible. Um, yeah, and with that, I'll get back to you, Christina, to, to lead us into the discussion. Thank you so much, Alex and April. Those are really great presentations, um, really exciting work. And now we just wanted to open it up for comments or questions. So you can either raise your hand or put something in the chat. We're happy to answer anything. Maybe how you intend to use the, oh yes, Pat. Yeah, you're on mute if you're talking, Pat. Uh, thank you. Um, great presentation. And it looks like the database is pretty um, uh, complete. I'm really impressed. Um, to what extent has this database been used to help identify sea level rise at different areas? Um, I know jurisdictions, as we're developing our own plans um, to try to plan for sea level rise at different scenarios, we don't have the capacity to build a system like this. So is it possible that this system could be used by cities and counties to help develop their own maps on what sea level, sea level rise will impact which developments and so we can start developing different scenarios. Uh, I can answer this first and then April, if you want to follow up. Um, uh, definitely it's being used for different types of tidal marsh vulnerability assessments. Um, and so from a, a habitat perspective, uh, kind of in relationship to the elevation data. And again, that's where the LIDAR can really be, be helpful in relating to the tidal datums. That data set in itself can be really informative uh, for that kind of assessment. Uh, and again, I, I think it also relates back to the different indicators and metrics that April talked about. Talking about the WRMP metrics, uh, there's even metrics such as percent vegetated that could be sort of a signal for vulnerability to sea level rise. And there's different metrics we did in the Baylands Resilience Framework that I encourage you to sort of uh, be able to, to dive into further. Um, and again, I, I guess lastly, uh, the VCDC, the Regional Shoreline Adaptation Plan, uh, is using the habitat map as well as various metrics that were developed uh, for that process. And so, April, do you have anything to, to add? Um, yeah, I think all that, that's right. I think that it will be more useful for, for understanding some of those changes once we do have that 2024 map so that what we're comparing to is more aligned with the map that we have now. Also thinking about some of the indicators that we've been talking about using, um, like percent vegetation or vegetated to unvegetated ratio. I think those are going to be once you're already seeing the impacts for sea level rise. So that will definitely be useful. But I, I think in thinking about leading versus trailing indicators, if we're able to see like some of the sea level rise changes directly, that might be more useful for planning um, than waiting till we're already seeing the impacts 
in marshes, at which case, I mean, we definitely still want to respond to that and plan to that, but that would probably be a little bit further down the road in terms of timeline and impacts. So do, uh, does then cities and counties then, do they contact BCDC to get a better understanding of the different sea level rise projections and impact on their, um, in their area? Can I, can I help answer this question? Guys, hi guys. So Pat, I think it sounds like what you're asking about is you're asking about flood vulnerability with climate change. And so yes. there's two there's two components to that, right? One is the sea level rise component and another is the sort of the watershed hydrology element to that, right? So not only do we have rising sea levels, we also are going to have, you know, larger storm events coming out of our watersheds and flooding those low lying areas. So that's why that <clears throat> understanding the elevations of those low lying areas is so critical. So right now, the elevation data that this effort has been relying on that Alex and Pete and Christina and April and, and that their team has so well put so, you know, done such a tremendous job that. <clears throat> work is based on a kind of patchwork quilt of different elevation sets that are of different ages, of different quality. And so in particularly in the low lying areas, there's an error associated with that elevation, right? And so this new LIDAR effort that um, the, the WRMP is looking for cost share partners uh, for, this is an effort to get really high quality elevation data for the entire, for all of the Baylands. And right now, as, as you know, this is done often on a county by county basis, sometimes on a municipality by municipality basis. We're trying to get one consistent data set for the whole region that can then be used in these analyses that are being done by the WRMP and also by our partners at BCDC, for example, the Flood Explorer, right? That one of the key input data sets to the BCDC sea level rise flood explorer is elevation. So once we have that improved elevation data, that'll be a tremendous help to the WRMP, to the flood explorer, to all of these different analyses that different communities are doing with regards to sea level rise vulnerability. Got it. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. That was a, a great explanation. Appreciate it. Karen, I, I saw your hand was up. Do you still have a question? I was trying to type it in. Okay. I, um, I, had, I had two questions. One I may have misheard, but I thought I heard Alex say that there are efforts to map additional habitats. On, and if I didn't mishear, um, could you maybe shed light on what those additional habitats might be? And then the second is with respect to utilizing the habitat change mapping um, in conjunction with something like the RCEP. Um, one of the concerns that uh, the environmental community has is that, well, it's absolutely critical that we're tracking changes. Um, how, how time, um, how timely are those are those updates to the mapping? Because you know you don't want to get five years down the road and with sea level rise and the pressures of development, say, oh my God, we're out of space for more tidal marsh migration or, or mitigation um, or restoration. So could you um, provide some insight into how this might work with the RSAP and um, in terms of updates? to the mapping? Yeah, great question, Karen. I'll do my best. Um, I'm not fully involved with the RCEP process, but maybe someone else on this call can provide a little bit further context, but I don't want to misspeak for them. Um, for the other classes that we're working on, we had uh, previously an other open water category that um, felt that ended up being a bit generic and needed a little bit further classification. I think from our habitat perspective, we could sort of identify those and classify them um in that category um but there's kind of an added effort or, or you know kind of a need to sort of divide that out into sort of where does that kind of fit is it a managed open water is it a you know salt pond is it um you know this muted category that so that's 
in an effort that we're just trying to sort of add some refinement to to that classification to enable further analyses. Um, and then, um, so yes, that's that's the main kind of area that we're trying to add some further classifications. Uh, in regard to, um, I guess, the change detection and the question you asked regarding relationship to RSAP, um, I think that really plays out with the metrics and the framework that April hinted at with the WRMP indicators and with all the rest of the science that's ongoing through that process with the regional monitoring is kind of collating all the information and putting it into context that enables us to have better um, data information to, to make informed decisions um, and how these all kind of relate together. What can we understand or learn from one part of the estuary or one type of um, marsh or setting that can be leveraged to understand better decision in either restoration or planning or management of these habitats. Um, that's, I, I, that's where my head first goes. Uh, April, do you want to add anything, I guess, on that front? I don't know that I have anything to add. I think it's a really important question. And I I, I would think that as we um, further develop and refine these approaches and these tools, it's it, it will get faster and we'll get from the mapping effort all the way to the results and the messaging and the stuff that community needs to know. I expect that will, will be faster over time, but I think it's a really important point and something we need to keep in mind. And then just looking in the chat, Karina, you did have a question about um, the higher for the higher quality data sets, could on the ground collection help and what citizen science community monitoring opportunities are available for volunteers? And thank you, Christina, for responding. Um, I'm not sure if Sasha, if you wanna also jump in on the people and wetlands work group and how that could answer this question. Sure, yeah, so um, I, yeah, there's two parts to this question. The ground data collection does help validate the map and um, the WRMP is going to do some of that. In terms of citizen science and community monitoring, we did recently were awarded funding from the EPA to create pilot community monitoring and collaboration with community-based organizations and or tribes around the Bay Area. So we're really excited about that. We haven't actually gotten the funding yet in our offers, but we're hopeful that um, those efforts will start in the planning phases, probably in January of 2025, and continue um, from there. So I would expect in three to five years that we would have a robust pilot program of citizen science and community monitoring. And um, if you're interested in, in being involved with that, um, uh, please reach out. Thanks. Yeah, and I'll just add on to the ground truthing piece is um, one of the uh, one of the goals of the EPA funding in the next year is to do on the ground vegetation monitoring. And we're hoping that combining that with the LIDAR, the new LIDAR data set that we'll have, that we'll be able to do some ground truthing through that work as well. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Donna thank, and Sasha. Uh, there was another question also in the chat from Nick Rollins about the possibility of extending this great work into the upper estuary. And Christina Toms also mentioned uh, that the WRMP is pursuing this with other partners in the Delta Stewardship Council, but just wanted to see if Nick or Christina wanted to add anything else to this. We're, we're, we're hoping. <laughs> I don't have yeah. too much to add. Yeah, other than that right now, we would really like, you know, we are, the Delta Stewardship Council is a part of our steering committee and part of our TAC. And, um, you know, there's a lot that goes into um, coordination along the entire estuary. It's a big, uh, you know, that's a big, big space to cover. Um, but that's definitely something where we are actively pursuing. And and I have to give a shout out to Hannah Kempf here on this call. Uh, she's a Sea Grant Fellow with the WRMP, and she's helping to do just that. So if you have some ideas about how to help with that, please uh, reach out to Hannah. More questions or comments? Then I think we have a few minutes to do a quick poll. 
um, the WRMP would really like to continue doing these these webinars to to highlight some of the products and some of the findings from the WRMP. So we just have a very quick poll that would just kind of help us in terms of of topics that would be interesting for others. So if you have a few moments, since we have a few minutes, just to kind of answer the four questions, that would be great. And is the poll working for everyone? It is, thank you, Sarah. And there is an open-ended question at the bottom for just any comments about today's presentation or questions as well as topics. And if you did answer other for what is your professional role, maybe you can add that to the open-ended question in number four. give people a few other a few more minutes to answer this Okay, maybe just one more minute and then we can look at the results. And also just wanted to mention if you joined late, if you could add your email and name in the chat, that would be really helpful for us to follow up with you. And then we will also be posting this recording. But where will you be posting the recording on the SFEI website? Uh, probably on the WRMP website. WRMP. Yeah, and we'll send that out in a, okay, a follow-up email. Thank you. Okay, so let me go ahead and end the poll and share the results. And, and what about the slides? Can you send the slides out as well? Yeah, we're happy to. Thank you. And I think I'll just go ahead and stop the recording now, so...